the day of judgment is drawing near with every passing moment. It seems far, but in fact it is not. And there is hisab, there is accounting, when we will be interrogated, we will be asked about what we spent our lives doing, what kind of things we did. We see that every now and then, we are reminded of our mortality. But we soothe ourselves with worldly comforts, distracting ourselves. But being distracted from a reality does not make it go away. The person who realizes that this life is not forever, that there is hisab, there is questioning after death, then they're able to control their desires. They're able to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. And then they feel comfort in doing good things. They don't turn away, they turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us very clearly about the nearness of this day. He said, I do not belong to the world, nor does it belong to me. I was sent while the hour is racing with me. Nastabiqu, meaning both are as if trying to get ahead of each other. This is how soon the day of judgment is going to occur. In another narration, he demonstrated its nearness by joining his two fingers together. Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu said that when a third of the night had passed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stood up and he said, O oh people, remember Allah, remember Allah. The Rajifa convulsion is coming, followed by the Radifa, the subsequent one. And he was referring to the tremors, the earthquakes that will happen at the Day of Judgment. Death and what it brings is coming. Death and what it brings is coming. So wake up, get up and do something. Don't sleep in your heedlessness. Don't turn away in your heedlessness. So remember, with each passing day and with each passing night, our death is drawing near. And the day of judgment is drawing near. The countdown has already begun. And with each day, worldly life is only getting shorter. So we are drawing closer to death than to life. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ warned us about how suddenly the day of judgment is going to come. And he also said that Jannah is nearer to you than your shoelace, and so is the fire of hell. So don't think it's far. ما يأتيهم من ذكر من ربهم محدث إلا استمعوه وهم يلعبون. No mention comes to them anew from their Lord except that they listen to it while they are at play. لا هي قلوبهم with their hearts distracted, meaning they hear the Quran with distracted hearts. They listen to the Quran while they are completely inattentive. They're too busy having fun to pay attention to the Qur'an. And when a person does this with the book of Allah, then they fail to benefit from it. No matter how powerful those verses may be, they will not have an impact on the heart of such a person who is distracted. Why? Because this person will fail to comprehend the meaning of those verses. They will fail to comprehend the wisdom which is contained within those verses. And then their heart is not going to move. And those who do wrong conceal their private conversation saying, is this prophet except a human being like you? So would you approach magic while you are aware of it? So we see this is how the people of Makkah would dismiss the Prophet ﷺ by saying things like, oh, he's only a human being. So are you really going to follow him? And they would dismiss the impact of the Quran by calling it magic. So instead of paying attention to its message, they would think of ways to thwart its effect. So the response of the Prophet ﷺ to such lies, to such rejection, to such baseless criticism, what should it be? The Prophet said, My Lord knows whatever is said throughout the heaven and earth, and He is a samir the hearing, Al-Alim, the knowing. But they say, the revelation is but a mixture of false dreams. Rather, he has invented it. Rather, he is a poet. So we see that there was not a single any insult or accusation except that they smeared the Prophet ﷺ with it. They said, so let him bring us a sign, just as the previous messengers were sent with miracles. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا آمَنَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَفَهُمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ Not a single city which we destroyed believed before them. So will they believe? Meaning the previous nations received miracles, they did not believe, so what makes them different now? And we sent not before you except men to whom we revealed. So ask the people of the message if you do not know. Meaning always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent human beings as prophets. So if people find that strange, they should look at Ahl al-Dhikr, the people of the previous scriptures. Meaning the Jews and the Christians. Look at their scripture. What do they say? Who were the previous prophets? Were they human or something else? And in general also, we learn a very important rule from this part of the ayah, that ask the people of the message if you do not know. Meaning that when you do not know about something, then find out. Don't settle with being ignorant, with not knowing. Find out what the truth is. Find out what the answer is. Imam Al-Ajuri said that the bearer of the Qur'an studies the Qur'an to discipline himself according to it. And he is not pleased with himself to perform with ignorance what Allah the Mighty and Majestic has obligated upon him. Because he has made knowledge and comprehension his guide towards every goodness. So a person who wants to live by the Qur'an, then they will not settle with you know questions that are not answered. They will find out. And sometimes, yes, we hesitate asking. We feel shy that people will judge us, that you don't even know this much. But it is important to ask so that we can know. And we did not make the Prophet's forms, meaning the Prophets did not have such bodies not eating food, nor were they immortal on earth. They died and they left this world. Then we fulfilled for them the promise, and we saved them and whom we willed, and destroyed the transgressors. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ We have certainly sent down to you a book in which is your mention. Then will you not reason? Meaning, aren't you going to pay heed? Aren't you going to give some attention to this book which is about you? فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ and fihi dhikrukum, what this means is that the Qur'an mentions you, meaning it talks about you. You are the subject of the Qur'an. So aren't you going to take any interest in it? Subhanallah, if you find out that your name was mentioned in a news article, you will take that clipping and save it for your great-grandchildren to see. And the Qur'an talks about us. And we need to take interest in the Qur'an. The Qur'an, it mentions fihi dhikrukum, meaning it mentions what is good in you and what is bad in you. Your strengths and your weaknesses. The good things that you do and the mistakes that you make. So if you really want to know yourself, if you really want to understand yourself, then you have to study the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is like a mirror. It helps you see yourself. It helps you understand yourself. And then fihi dhikrukum also means that it brings honor and glory to you if you follow it. And fihi dhikrukum also means that it mentions details related to your religion so that you can do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you of. If you don't know, then you will be living life in ignorance. And it also mentions the things that you need to know on which your life and success depends on. So, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ And we see that in the time of the companions, especially, and the time afterwards, that there were people who were previously slave. And because of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them so much dignity and honor. Umar radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that by this book, Allah will exalt some people and degrade others. And how many a city which was unjust have we shattered and produced after it another people? Now this surah is Surah Al-Anbiya, the surah of the prophets. So we will see that a lot of verses are related to prophets, the tests that they faced, the difficulties that they endured at the hands of their people, and then how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them and how they responded to their nations. And when its inhabitants perceived our punishment, at once they fled from it. Some angel said, do not flee, but return to where you were given luxury and to your homes. Perhaps you will be questioned. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُسْأَلُونَ They said, oh woe to us, indeed we were wrongdoers. Yani at that time, they admitted.
And this happens with so many people that all their lives people are in heedlessness, just pursuing desires. But then when death comes knocking at the door, at that time a person is filled with regrets. Inna kunna zalimin. And that declaration of theirs did not cease until we made them as a harvest mowed down, extinguished like a fire. Meaning they were like a pile of ashes, not a degree of life remained in them. وَمَا خَلَقُنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ And we did not create the heaven and earth and that between them in play. Meaning, this was not all aimless for fun. No, this is all for a good reason. Had we intended to take a diversion, meaning a game to amuse ourselves with, we could have taken it from what is with us. Meaning then we would not have created you, if indeed we were to do so. Rather, we dash, we hurl the truth upon falsehood, and it destroys it, and thereupon it departs. And for you is destruction from that which you describe. Meaning, once the truth comes, then falsehood cannot remain. To him belongs whoever is in the heavens and the earth, and those near him are not prevented by arrogance from his worship, nor do they tire. These are the angels who are near Allah. And how are they described? That they are not prevented by arrogance from His worship. Nor do they get tired. They don't get bored. And because of their humility, what happens? يُسَبِّحُونَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارُ لَا يَفْتُرُونَ They exalt Him night and day and do not slacken. Meaning they don't even take a break. They don't get tired by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said that the sky, the heaven, creaks. And it has every right to creak. Because there is no place that could contain four fingers in the heavens except that there is an angel over there standing, making rukur or making sajda to Allah. Meaning it is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly, whether it is night or it is day, whether years have gone by, they're constantly worshipping Allah and they don't slack and they don't get bored. They don't stop. You know, these are angels. But what happens to us? We, of course, we lose interest, we get distracted, we begin to yawn. And this is the etiquette that we have been taught actually, that we recite the Qur'an as long as your heart is in it. And once you start to feel tired, yani, don't push yourself to recite the Qur'an in a state where your heart is not interested. Because then you will begin to resent it. You will begin to dislike it. And then your intention will not be that pure. Your effort will not be that beautiful. And that will affect your reward also. So at that time, take a break. When you're too sleepy, when you're getting tired, take a break. Freshen up and then come back. And then start again. So this is us, us human beings. We have our limitations, our weaknesses. But it doesn't mean that we begin to feel very lazy now. And then every time we open the Qur'an, because we're not that interested, we don't even try, we don't even exert any effort. No, we have to exert effort. We have to push ourselves. And you know what? We have to set goals for ourselves on a regular basis. You know, sometimes what happens is that we start making dhikr and then someone comes and starts talking to us. You know, children, they interrupt us and then we forget what we were saying and then we forget to complete our, you know, adhkar. So it is very important that we set our goals and we fix certain times and then we also communicate with our children that, you know, mama is doing her adhkar right now. Just give me a few minutes, then I will talk to you. Right? So they should also know so that we are able to complete our adhkar. Or have men taken for themselves gods from the earth who resurrect the dead? Had there been within the heavens and earth gods besides Allah, they both would have been ruined. So exalted is Allah, Lord of the throne, above what they describe. We see that when there is anything over which multiple individuals have power over, then yani, we see how those things, those places, those items, how they get ruined, they get destroyed. Why? Because each does whatever they please and then there is conflict and because of that conflict we see how things, places, even children at times they suffer. So the fact that the heavens and the earth are in existing in such harmony, what does that prove? That there is only one God. 
So exalted is Allah, Lord of the throne, above what they describe. لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون He is not questioned about what he does, but they will be questioned. So remember, no one can ask Allah about what he does, but he has the right to ask everyone about what they do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not to be questioned about what he decides regarding his creation. Rather, he has the right to ask his creatures about what they do. So we should not be obsessed about, you know, thinking all the time, why did God allow this? Why was this destined? And why did Allah command us to do this? We should be concerned about the fact that we will be asked about what we are doing. We have to realize who we are. And we have to realize who our Lord is. He is not questioned. He is the owner. He is Al-Alim. He is Al-Hakim. He can do whatever He wants. And who are we? We are Mamluk. We are owned by Him. And He is the one who has commanded us. So there is no equality over here. So we should remember our place. Or have they taken gods besides Him? Say, produce your proof. This Qur'an is the message for those with me and the message of those before me. Meaning the previous nations were also given scriptures. But most of them do not know the truth, so they are turning away. And we sent not before you any messenger except that we reveal to him that there is no deity except me. So worship me. This was the message in every scripture brought by every messenger. And they say, the most merciful has taken a son. Exalted is he. Rather they are, but honored servants. They cannot precede him in word, and they act by his command. He knows what is presently before them, and what will be after them. And they cannot intercede except on behalf of one whom he approves. And they, from fear of him, are apprehensive. This is the state of Allah's servants, that they are afraid of Allah. They're apprehensive. So a lot of times, you know, people will come up with things regarding the Prophet ﷺ, for example, that he will intercede and he will say whatever he wants and he will fight for his ummah and then Allah will not be able to say anything to him. Yani, astaghfirullah, it's difficult to even listen to such songs of poetry and praise for the Prophet ﷺ. In poetry, yes, it's understandable that things are not always realistic, but we have to be truthful. We cannot go on raising the status of the Prophet ﷺ and the servants of Allah over Allah Azza wa Jal. And he remember the place of the creation? That the creation is below the Creator. So they from fear of Him are apprehensive. And whoever of them should say, Indeed, I am a God besides Him, meaning even if a righteous servant of Allah says that, that one we would recompense with hell. Thus do we recompense the wrongdoers. Have those who disbelieved not considered that the heavens and the earth were a joined entity? They were together. They were one thing, meaning it was a state of singularity. And we separated them and made from water every living thing. Then will they not believe? So two very important facts are mentioned over here. That how the skies and the earth were a joint entity. And Allahu A'lam what exactly this means. Skarb al-Ahbar said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated the sky and the earth by admitting air between the two, space between the two. Ikrima said that the sky was closed, the earth was closed, so no water rained and no plant grew. And today there is a big bang theory. Yani Allahu A'lam. But the fact is that the sky and the earth did not exist as they exist today. Allah is the one who brought them into existence. And all of this variety of creation that we see did not exist before. Allah is the one who brought every living thing alive from water. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kullu shay'in khuliqa mimma. Everything was created from water. Meaning every living thing was created from water. So, أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Will they not believe? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created us. Then, what are we supposed to do? This life is not for play and amusement. All of this has a purpose. And we are supposed to be spending this time in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what is it that we are doing? 
and we placed within the earth firmly set mountains, lest it should shift with them, and we made therein mountain passes as roads that they might be guided, meaning natural roadways, highways through the mountains so that people can find their way and travel from place to place. And we made the sky a protected ceiling, but they from its signs are turning away. وَهُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِهَا مُعْرِضُونَ And this shows us how important it is for us to pay attention to both types of ayat. Remember there are two types of ayat. Ayat shari'iyya, meaning verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. The Qur'an, that deserves our attention. And then ayat kawniya, the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within the creation for us to observe, to listen to, to understand, to pay attention to. So both of these deserve our attention. So we must learn about them, study them, reflect upon them. And if it's done with the right intention, then this is also ibadah. Sometimes what happens is that if a person is studying, for example at school, they begin to think that it's a waste of my time. This is not a waste of time when it's done with the right intention. When you do it with the intention that I am studying Allah's creation, and it is He who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, all heavenly bodies in an orbit are swimming. And we did not grant to any man before you eternity meaning on earth. So if you die, would they be eternal? So we see here that even prophets had to leave the world. Jibreel said to the Prophet ﷺ, that live however long you want, you will indeed die. Love whomever you want, you will eventually leave him. So the fact is that there is no permanence in this world. There is no together forever in this life. And there is only eternity where? In the home of the hereafter, in Jannah. So the people of Makkah, you know, they would say about the Prophet ﷺ that just wait for him to die. Very soon he's gonna die and this new religion that he's come up with is going to come to an end. So it is said, Afa imitta fahumul khalidun. So if you die, would they be eternal? So don't wish for people to die because even if they die, you're not living in this world forever. Every nafs, every soul will taste death. And we test you with evil and with good as trial. And to us, you will be returned. So we see over here that death is certain for every nafs, every human. And in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us. With what? With evil and with good. And evil and good both are a trial. And after this, we have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So things don't happen at random in this life. And we see that there is neither all ease in this life nor hardship. There is a blend of both. And they come, you know, ease and hardship, you know, they come and leave just like seasons do. Why? Why is it that things are always changing? So that the patient and the grateful are set apart from the rest. So that we are tested through things that we like and also things that we don't like. So that we remember that good things in this life are not going to last forever. This life is not everything. There is something better that awaits us. Because you see, when we go through some difficulty, some pain in life, what does it do? It ruins worldly pleasure. And then that allows you to think about the home of the hereafter. And then you're like, okay, you're more inclined to performing more righteous deeds. You're more inclined to giving sadaqah, that same money that you were so attached to before. Because you went through hardship, now you're so eagerly, you know, you're willing to spend it in good causes. And when those who disbelieve see you, they take you not except in ridicule, saying, Is this the one who insults your gods? And they are at the mention of the most merciful disbelievers. Subhanallah. You see, the people of Makkah, they loved their idols. They had way too much respect for their idols. So if the Prophet wasallam said that La ilaha illallah, there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah, they would take that statement as an insult. That this is an insult to our gods. However, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was described as Ar-Rahman, the entirely merciful, the extremely merciful, they would reject that. So it is mentioned over here that they have so much tolerance for multiple gods, but when it comes to the beautiful descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
they cannot tolerate that, they cannot accept that. And this is the reason why when Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim was written in Sul Hudaybiyah in the treaty, they had that removed because they wouldn't accept it. Khuliqal insanu min ajal. Man was created of haste. And this is the reason why as human beings we get anxious. We get impatient and worried. We fret and fear. We panic and worry. You know, we regret and we grieve. And because of all of this, we fail to exist in the present. You see, because of our hastiness, we either dwell in our past or in our future. You know, we're always thinking about what happened before, it might happen again. And so, because it might happen again, that fear causes us to become extremely anxious. So it is said here, I will show you my signs, so do not impatiently urge me. So we see that even though we are naturally predisposed towards being anxious and hasty, we're still able to manage and control this hastiness. Because if it was not possible, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have commanded us, لا تستعجلون, do not impatiently urge me. So how is it that we can manage this ujla, this hastiness, that we practice focusing on the present, the now, that we take things one day at a time. Because if we keep thinking about everything that happened in the past, and then everything that might happen in the future, yani we would get overwhelmed. And that would really cause us to panic. So take it one day at a time, one task at a time. Bring yourself back to the moment. Bring yourself back to the task at hand. And you see, when we become anxious, that is when we become hasty. We make quick decisions which are sometimes detrimental and we regret later on. So be more mindful of the present. Practice mindfulness. سَأُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِي فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ And we see that calmness, which is the opposite of ujala. Yani this is also in our fitra, meaning this is also something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us upon. We're not only predisposed to being hasty and impatient and anxious, we also have the capacity to be calm. So we learn in a hadith that once a certain delegation came to the Prophet wasallam, and as soon as they arrived, everybody, you know, as they were, they just jumped to be with the Prophet wasallam, and they began kissing his hands and, you know, embracing him, etc. And then finally, one of the men, he came, and he came later, because first he went to his luggage, he changed his clothes, because they had just arrived after a journey, he changed his clothes, he washed up, and then he came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he met him. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, that you have two qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes, gentleness and deliberation. So he asked, have I acquired them, or has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them in my nature? The Prophet wasallam said, No, Allah has created them in you. So he said, Alhamdulillah, that Allah has created these abilities in me or these characteristics in me. So yes, some people, they are yani, more calm and other people have to make themselves calm, right? But they are able to. It is possible to keep yourself calm in the face of anxiety or in the face of challenges. And it is important that we don't allow our hastiness to drive us, to lead us. Because then we will suffer. وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And they say, when is this promise if you should be truthful? If those who disbelieved but knew the time, when they will not avert the fire from their faces or from their backs, and they will not be aided. Rather, it will come to them unexpectedly and bewilder them, and they will not be able to repel it nor will they be reprieved. And already were messengers ridiculed before you, but those who mocked them were enveloped by what they used to ridicule. Say, who can protect you at night or by day from the most merciful? But they are from the remembrance of their Lord turning away. Notice how the night is mentioned before the day. Who can protect you at night or by day? Why is the night mentioned first? Because if you think about it, night is the default. 
Right? There is darkness. And light is because of the rising of the sun. So night is the default and then the day comes and leaves. And then also in the context, if you think about it, the night is more scarier than the day. We are more vulnerable in darkness than we are in light. So it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He protects us in darkness when we are unable to see what dangers are ahead of us. Or do they have gods to defend them other than us? They are unable even to help themselves, nor can they be protected from us. But on the contrary, we have provided good things for these and their fathers until life was prolonged for them. Because typically what happens is that when people get wealth and you know, and good things in this life, generation after generation, then they stop worrying about their deeds, about their actions. Because they don't need to worry about anything. So they feel that their good times will never end. And they're very satisfied with their circumstances. So they're not concerned anymore about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when people experience blessings for a long time, then what happens is that majority of the people, they get deceived Whereas in reality, it is a test. Then do they not see that we set upon the land, reducing it from its borders? So it is they who will overcome? At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it happened with the mushrikeen that politically, yani, over time, they were losing their freedom. So don't they see that they're losing control of the land? Say, I only warn you by revelation, but the deaf do not hear the call when they are warned. And if as much as a whiff of the punishment of your Lord should touch them, they would surely say, O oh, woe to us, indeed we have been wrongdoers. And we place the scales of justice for the day of resurrection. Meaning on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will set up the scale in which our deeds will be weighed. And this is something that we have to believe in. This is part of our faith. This is part of Iman bil Akhirah. So no soul will be treated unjustly at all. Why? Because wal waznu yawma idin al And if there is even the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it forth. Because that scale is very sensitive. It is very just. It is very fair. So if there is something that is equal to the weight of a mustard seed, even that will be brought. And sufficient are we as accountant. So the scale is basically a formality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of it. He is just without even using the scale. But the scale, the wazan will be used on the day of judgment to establish justice, to prove to people that no injustice has been done to you. And this is the reason why we have to pay attention to the little things as well. Earlier I had mentioned to you how La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. These are words which are heavy in the scale. The dhikr of Allah, which we don't really pay much attention to, is very heavy in the scale. So we have to make sure that during the day, during the night, you know, we keep our tongue busy with the dhikr of Allah. That our tongue should not just be busy talking to people. And especially now that everybody's home, all of our time and our energy should not just go in just talking to each other. Yes, there should be time talking to one another, but there should also be time spent in making dhikr, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these words will be very, very heavy in the scale. And then it is said that there will be no injustice at all. No injustice whatsoever. So we learned that on the Day of Judgment, a person will be brought and his records, which will be in the form of 99 registers, they will be placed on one side of the scale. And these records will be so huge and they'll be filled with deeds. And this person, he will be asked that do you deny any of this, meaning any of the sins that are mentioned over here that are recorded in these books, do you deny any of that? And he will say, no. He will be asked, did my angels wrong you? Were they unfair to you? Did they write something that you did not do? No. Do you have any excuse? No, I don't have any excuse. So the person will think that I'm done. Because all of my deeds are being weighed against me. And then a card, a small card, will be placed on the other side of the scale. And that card will have on it, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. And because of that card, the scale will tip. Subhanallah, the scale will tip. Meaning, this is the value, the weight of the kalima, la ilaha illallah. To believe is not something small. 
وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ الْفُرْقَانِ And we had already given Musa and Harun the criterion, the Torah, which was a light and a reminder for the righteous, who fear their Lord and seen while they are of the hour apprehensive. And this Qur'an is a blessed message, ذِكْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ which we have sent down. Then are you with it, unacquainted? Really? Are you unfamiliar with the book of Allah? This book which is Mubarak, which is full of Barakah. And remember, Barakah is increase and permanence and growth. So this book is not like any other book. Its benefit is endless. It is ever increasing. You see, in different times, in different places, people have benefited from the Qur'an in so many different ways. They have benefited spiritually, materially, financially, in their ibadah, in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in their rizq, in their families, because of this Qur'an. So, أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ Are you going to turn away from this? Are you going to remain unacquainted and unfamiliar with the book of Allah? So don't be like that. Don't deprive yourself. Take it happily, lovingly, and increase in your blessings by spending more time with the Book of Allah. And we had certainly given Ibrahim his sound judgment before, and we were of him well-knowing. When he said to his father and his people, what are these statues to which you are devoted? They said, we found our fathers worshippers of them. And we see that when it comes to idolatry, this is really the only proof that it is tradition. He said, you were certainly, you and your fathers in manifest error. They said, have you come to us with truth or are you of those who jest? He said, no, rather your Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth who created them. And I to that am of those who testify. So I'm not joking around over here. I'm serious. And I swear by Allah, I will show thee plan against your idols after you have turned and gone away. So he made them into fragments, except a large one among them, that they might return to it. They said, who has done this to our gods? Indeed, he is of the wrongdoers. They said, we heard a young man mention them, who is called Ibrahim. They said, then bring him before the eyes of the people, that they may testify. They said, have you done this to our gods, O Ibrahim? He said, rather, this, the largest of them, did it. So ask them if they should be able to speak. So he did this, meaning he broke their idols. This was a very drastic measure, but he did this to make them realize, to make them understand, so that they would think. And then when he said that ask them, meaning the idols, who broke them, perhaps it was the largest of them, yani ask, ask them if they can speak, they will be able to tell you. So they returned to blaming themselves and said to each other, Indeed, you are the wrongdoers. You are at fault. Ibrahim is right. These idols neither speak nor are they able to defend themselves. So they got it. They understood what Ibrahim was showing them. But then they reversed themselves, saying, You have already known that these do not speak. They admitted the inability of their idols to speak. He said, then do you worship instead of Allah that which does not benefit you at all nor harm you? Oof to you! And to what you worship instead of Allah, what are you doing? Then will you not use reason? They said, burn him and support your gods if you are to act. قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرُدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ Allah said, O oh fire, be coolness and safety upon Ibrahim. Subhanallah. They refuse to accept the truth even after seeing it. Even after admitting in their hearts, they refuse to accept it. And then what did they do? They decided to burn Ibrahim alayhi salam. Just finish him completely. Kill him alive. And they plotted. They built a huge fire. But their plot, remember, was still in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control. Remember, if the fire burns... It burns by the law of Allah, by the permission of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change that any moment, any time for whoever that He wants. This is why He said, Bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be coolness and salam. Meaning be coolness and safety. Because cold can freeze, right? And it can literally kill a person. Frostbite, etc. It can kill a person. So the fire was not just cold. It was also security. It was also safety. And then, ala Ibrahim, it was only for Ibrahim a.s., not for the rest of the people. Otherwise, the nature of fire would be changed until the Day of Judgment. 
وَأَرَادُوا بِهِ كَيْدًا And they intended for him harm, but we made them the greatest losers. And we delivered him and Lut to the land which we had blessed for the worlds. أَلَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا And this is the land of Bayt al Jerusalem. And we gave him Ishaq and Yaqub in addition, and all of them we made righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Ibrahim alayhi salam with Ishaq alayhi salam, meaning Ishaq alayhi salam, his son. And then Yaquba nafilatan. Yaqub and addition. Who was Yaqub alayhi salam? His grandson. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him more than he had asked for. He didn't pray for a grandson. He prayed for a son. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a son and a grandson. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity. Ibrahim alayhi salam made dua, Rabbi habli min as-salihin. That, oh my Lord, grant me among those who are righteous. Meaning, grant me righteous, good children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him sons and grandsons. And he, what a blessing. This is how Allah is. You take one step, Allah will give you even more than what you imagined. And we made them leaders, guiding by our command. And we inspire to them the doing of good deeds, establishment of prayer, and giving of zakat. And they were worshippers of us. So we see that among his children, there were many righteous worshippers. And to Lut, we gave judgment and knowledge. And we saved him from the city that was committing wicked deeds. Indeed, they were people of evil, defiantly disobedient. And we admitted him into our mercy. Indeed, he was of the righteous. Lut a.s. was salih. And his nation, his people, they used to ta'malu al-khaba'is. They used to commit wicked deeds. What a contrast. وَنُوحًا And mention Nuh when he called to Allah before that time. So we responded to him and saved him and his family from the great distress من الكرب العظيم. And what was this كرب العظيم that Nuh السلام, was faced with? This is of course referring to the long time that he spent calling people to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And remember, when people reject you, not just once or twice, but over and over again, and their rejection turns into hostility and mockery and then abandonment. Yani, it's very, very hurtful. It turns into al-karb al-azim. And the longer a trial is, the more difficult it feels. So it was a great distress, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved him from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from that. And it is said that Al-Karb Al-Azim can also refer to the flood, the drowning, because that certainly is very, very distressful. And we saved him from the people who denied our signs. Indeed, they were a people of evil, so we drowned them all together. And mentioned Dawood and Sulaiman, when they judged concerning the field. What was this incident? This was when the sheep of a people overran it at night. So it is said that there were two neighbors, one was a shepherd and the other was a farmer. So in the night time, the sheep of the shepherd ran into the field of the farmer. And you can imagine if sheep become loose in a farm, in a garden, what's going to happen to it? So they completely destroyed it. So what happened? These two people came for justice to Dawood alayhi salam and we were witness to their judgment. And we gave understanding of the case to Sulaiman alayhi salam. Dawood alayhi salam ruled that the owner of the field, the farmer, should keep the sheep. Okay? And Sulaiman alayhi salam said that no, the owner of the field should be given the sheep to benefit from until the shepherd tends to the field and restores it. And once the field, the farm has been restored, then the flock should be returned to him. Then each owner should take back his property. What a beautiful decision. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was given understanding of this case. And sometimes it happens. You know, you face such questions or such situations which are very difficult to comprehend. You don't understand how to solve that issue. And then you talk to different people, you take their suggestions, and you make dua, and then eventually, alhamdulillah, you come to a good decision. So remember, good faham, good understanding of a matter. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is said, فَفَهَمْنَاهَا Sulaiman. We gave understanding to Sulaiman alayhi salam. So whenever you're struggling to understand something, 
ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that ya mufahima Sulaimana fahimni that oh Allah you gave comprehension to Sulaiman you give me comprehension as well you give me good decision and good judgment as well and then it is said wa kullan atayna hukman wa ilma and to each of them we gave judgment and knowledge and we subjected the mountains to exalt us along with Dawood and also the birds and we were doing that so we see here that even though Sulaiman salam was the son, he was younger. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him understanding in that situation. So sometimes it is possible that people who are younger than you are able to suggest what is better. People who may have less life experience than you, less knowledge than you. And you might just not pay any attention to them, but it is worth listening to them. Because you never know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have given them understanding at that point. So don't dismiss people just because they're younger, they know less, or they speak a different language, they don't do what you do. But rather, be open. Learn from those who are around you. Listen to what people have to say. And then we see that Dawood alayhi salam, even though his understanding at this time was not the best, he is not condemned over here. Why? Because when a judge makes a judgment based on his knowledge and best ability, he is still rewarded. Even if that judgment, even if that ruling ended up to be wrong. But he is still rewarded for his sincerity and his effort. But if a person makes the right decision, the conclusion is good, then remember there is double reward. Double reward. And if a person is lazy and with ignorance, they give a wrong ruling, then for that, of course, is sin. So we have to be very, very careful. And we taught him the fashioning of coats of armor to protect you from your enemy in battle. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ شَاكِرُونَ So will you then be grateful? So we see that the prophets of Allah, especially Dawood a.s. was mentioned over here, they weren't just given scripture and religious knowledge. They were also given worldly skills, which we benefit from till today. And then it is said, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ شَاكِرُونَ Will you be grateful? Meaning, aren't you going to use the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you in obedience to Allah? Because that is shukr. And to Sulaiman, we subjected the wind blowing forcefully. Subhanallah. Dawood alayhi salam was given mastery over iron. So iron was very soft for him. It was very pliable for him. He could mold it however he wanted. And Sulaiman alayhi salam, wind was subjected for him. So one was given something solid and the other was given air. Amazing. And we see that wind can be very destructive and it can also be very productive. So wind was in his control, proceeding by his command toward the land which we had blessed and we are ever of all things knowing. And of the devils were those who dived for him and did work other than that. And we were of them a guardian. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him control over the jinn also. And mention Ayyub when he called to his Lord, "Anni masani al-durru wa anta arhamu rahimin Indeed, adversity has touched me, and you are the most merciful of the merciful. Fastajabna lahu, fakashafna ma bihi min dur. So we responded to him and removed what afflicted him of adversity. Allahu Akbar. We see that every person. You know, they suffer from some kind of adversity, some kind of personal adversity, which they experience either in their body, in their children, in their family situation, in their circumstances. And some conditions are such that a person is not even able to diagnose it. And you go to doctor after doctor and they don't even know what's going on with you. And even if they know what is going on with you, they're not in a position to help you because they don't know how to treat your condition. Or because circumstances don't allow. Yani, dur, when it touches you, then you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Ayyub alayhi salam did. And you see, Ayyub alayhi salam's adversity had prolonged for a very, very long time. It is said that he was suffering for 18 years. And when we are suffering from a pain for a very long time, then that duration adds even more pain to the pain that exists. You know, one is the pain which is in your body. Then there is the pain that you don't know what's happening. And then there is the pain that, you know, it's been going on for so long. When is this going to end? So look at what Ayyub alayhi salam said. Anni masani al-durru wa anta arhamur rahimin. And look at the word masani. You see, mas is what? It's just a touch. It's just a touch. 
Ayyub السلام, was suffering in his body, in his family, in his money, in his wealth. Yani in every aspect of his life he was suffering. Yet he called all of that suffering what? Just a mas, just a touch. Yani it's all about perspective, right? That has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only given you difficulty or with that difficulty has He also given you something else? So we need to remember that we should not blow things out of proportion. We have a headache and we pretend like we are going to die. Yani subhanallah, we're fasting and we think like we cannot do anything else. So see things in their proper size. Don't blow things out of proportion. And always remember that in the ma'al usri yusra, in the ma'al usri yusra. With difficulty is ease, with the same difficulty is another ease. So yes, there is dur, but there is also blessing that Allah has given. And whatever it is that you focus on is what will grow. So look at how he describes his condition. That adversity has just touched me. It has not overtaken me. It has not destroyed me. It has not overwhelmed me. Because Allah, you have also blessed me with so much. You, know, you can see the patience here and the gratitude over here. وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And look at how he is calling upon Allah. That Ya Allah, you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. So we responded to him. And we removed what afflicted him of adversity. It had been so long, 18 years, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed all of that. And we gave him back his family and the like thereof with them as mercy from us and a reminder for the worshippers of Allah. وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ What is the lesson? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests his servants however that he wants. لا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُ وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ Allah is not questioned about what he does, what he decides. We are going to be questioned about what we do, how we respond. So the first lesson is that it is up to Allah. It is His decision. It is His will to test His servants however that He wants. And then when we are going through some difficulty, it is important that we must not hate ourselves. Nor should we judge people who are going through difficulty. Because you see, Ayyub alayhi salam, he was a prophet of Allah. He was an abid. He was a worshiper. He was a good servant, a model servant. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him. So sometimes what happens is that when a person is going through trial, they think that, you know what, I must be very, very evil. I must be very, very bad. So God hates me. Or people wonder, why does God hate me? Because in general, any when we are going through some difficulty, we do think that this is because of our sins and this is something that we have been taught. It is true that trials affect us because of our sins. But those who worship Allah, the Abideen, then remember, for them, trials are not a punishment. Trials are only a means of purification and growth and increase in reward and further submission to Allah, which raises them even higher in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no matter what you're going through, don't hate yourself and don't let anyone tell you that God hates you. No, this is an opportunity for you to Focus on your ibadah. Be like Ayyub alayhi salam. Be an abid. And you will see how that trial, that difficulty will be in your favor, not against you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُصِبُ مِنْهُ Whoever Allah wishes good for, He puts him to trial. In another hadith we learn that when Allah loves a people, He tests them. So whoever is patient, then he will have patience. And whoever is impatient, then that is what he will have. Meaning he will grow in whatever he responds with. So always respond with sabr. And focus on ibadah. And then you will see that the trial will not be a punishment for you. It will be a purification, a growth, a means of increase for you, inshaAllah. And mention Ismail and Idris and Dhul Kifl, all were of the patient. Kullum min sabirin You see, this is Surah Al Anbiya, and we learned that the people who were tested the most severely were who? The Prophets of Allah. And then the next best, and then the next best. So people are tested in proportion to the level of their faith. So we see how the Prophets are described as Sabirin, those who were patient. What does that mean? That they endured hardship, they faced trials, and through those trials they were patient. 
and we admitted them into our mercy. وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُمْ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا So you see, after difficulty, yani when a person is in difficulty, in a trial, and they're patient, then what comes next? Rahma. Allah's mercy, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses His servants with in this life. But of course, the greatest mercy is reserved for the hereafter. وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُمْ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا إِنَّهُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Indeed, they were of the righteous. And this is what we need to focus on. That whether things are easy or they're tough. We have to focus on being amongst salih servants of Allah. Even if when big mistakes happen, and mention the man of the fish, Yunus alayhi salam, when he went off in anger. And sometimes this happens. Yani we get frustrated with our situation. But that frustration is not going to help us. Yunus alayhi salam got frustrated. He went off in anger and thought that we would not decree anything upon him. He didn't think that Allah would disapprove of this. And he called out within the darkness. Meaning he was trapped in the darkness of the fish, of the sea, of the night. There was no ray of light. And he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ilaha illa anta subhanak, inni kuntu min al That there is no deity except you. Exalted are you, O Allah. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. So Yunus alayhi salam admitted his mistake. And he called upon Allah. He declared the perfection of Allah. And what happened? فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we responded to him. Allah answered him also. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ And we saved him from distress, from worry, from sadness. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And thus do we save the believers. Remember, Allah saves the believers. And when we are put in a test, it is not to destroy us. And when we are in a trial, it is not that we have been left to fend for ourselves. No, Allah rescues His believing servants. So if we want Allah to rescue us, then we have to call upon Him. We have to seek His help. And there are so many beautiful lessons that we can learn from the prophets of Allah. So we see here the example of Yunus alayhi salam, where he made a mistake. And the predicament that he found himself in was a result of his own mistake. And sometimes this happens. When we are going through a certain hardship and we reflect on ourselves, we realize perhaps this is a result of my own injustice. Perhaps I am the reason why I am suffering from this. I have no one else to blame except myself. And even in that condition, you know what? You are still worthy. Even if you have every reason to blame yourself, to condemn yourself, you are still worthy. You are still able to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have no one to blame but yourself, you can still call upon Allah, like Yunus alayhi salam did. And look at what happened. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ Allah saved him from distress. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ This is for all believers, not just for Yunus alayhi salam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Should I not tell you about something which if a person says when stricken with distress or a trial from the trials of this world and prays to Allah, Allah will remove it from him? It was said, yes. And he said the dua of the noon. This dua. In another hadith we learn the supplication of the noon. Meaning of Yunus alayhi salam. When he supplicated while in the belly of the whale was, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al So indeed, no Muslim man supplicates with it for anything ever except that Allah responds to him. So when you find yourself in gham, any kind of gham, any kind of worry, distress, sadness, call upon Allah with these words, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al And Allah will rescue you just as He rescued His servant Yunus alayhi salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I hope everyone's still paying attention. We've gone through a lot of different events and stories in the past few ayahs. Um, considering, um, you know, we went from talking about, I mean, we ended up talking about Surah Yunus, uh, sorry, Prophet Yunus. Um, but before that, we talked about so many other prophets. Okay, 
um, some of these prophets like Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, um, and there were a lot of qualities also mentioned about these prophets. Does anyone know why these prophets were constantly mentioned in this surah? And I want everyone to participate as well. Even if you want to privately message on the chat, it's fine. Um, but I want to hear something from everyone. Why were why are prophets being constantly mentioned in this surah? It's something that she, that she mentioned. Yeah, for their patience. Yeah, that's one of the qualities of the prophets. But why do different prophets keep getting mentioned? Okay, why are the stories of different prophets being narrated in this surah? She actually mentioned this as well. Um, let's see if someone can pick it up. Okay, it's not really to do with the qualities. It's something. Yeah, these are all really good answers. So it, it is because of the qualities. Um, can Does anyone know? What's the name of this surah? She mentioned this as well. What's the name of this surah? Surah al Anbiya. What does Anbiya mean? Does anyone know what Anbiya means? Prophets. So the reason why this whole surah is kind of built on the different stories of the prophets is because it's name. So the name is kind of derived from the uh, from the events man mentioned, obviously. Um, but that is the reason so because the name of the surah is surah al-anbiya that's why different prophets are constantly being mentioned and again these beautiful answers as the reason Allah is telling us these stories is not just for narration purposes okay it's not just for um, us you know having fun listening to these stories okay or us having uh, okay le learn getting to learn your um, Islamic history is very important but more importantly, we're being taught these stories of different prophets um, to kind of understand the hardships they went through, okay? As a few people mentioned, to tell us about their test, okay, and their hardships. And it really shows us that if these prophets who, if we think about it, prophets and MBN and Rasul, the, the closest to Allah, and if they are going through so much hardship, what is it in for us, Okay. And Allah just, just doesn't tell us about their hardship and all, you know, the difficult times they had. But he also tells us what they did to fight that off. Okay. Um, and in this area right over here, that's being on, on this one display right now, we see how he talks about another, um, another prophet. Okay. And here Prophet Yunus or Jonah in English is being mentioned. Why? Okay. He tells us, it kind of gives us a bit of context where he that he went off in anger, okay? And thought that we could not de decree anything upon him, okay? And then when he was in darkness, when he was hopeless, well, he did have some hope, but, you know, when he was really upset, he was angry, he was going through all those emotions, and he was within darkness as well, okay? Because he was in the belly of the whale. So this symbolizes darkness, not just physical darkness, in the belly of the world, but also darkness in the fact that he was really upset and angry and he was going through um, a reflux of emotions, right? Um, and all of these emotions, how did he fight them off? He read this um, verse, okay? So he read from, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al um, And she also mentioned how through our times of distress, we should also read it. And they're really, they're really beautiful words. Um, there's also a bunch of other things she mentioned as well. Does anyone, does anyone want to share before we move on? So again, there's a lot of different prophets being mentioned: Ismail, Idris, Dhul Kifil. Um, here yeah, again, this is another story. Okay, this is the story of. Ayyub salam, where he was struck with years and years of adversity. Okay. And as she mentioned, 18 years of adversity. That's a very, very long time if you think about it. At all those times of adversity, he had patience. Okay. He had patience and he relied upon Allah for Allah to change his position, his status. Um, and then what does Allah say? And we gave him back his family and the like thereof with them as mercy from us and as, as sorry as a reminder for those worshippers of Allah. 
Okay. So again, this just shows us why we're being, um, you know, why all these stories are being thrown at us. It's for reminder. Okay. So all these stories are being mentioned to remind the worshippers. Okay. So kind of show them that you're not the first person to go th through all of this stuff. Here we learn about Ya'aqub alayhi salam as well. Sorry, Ayyub alayhi salam. And then up here we also had Ibrahim, Suleiman alayhi salam, all of these different prophets. Would anyone like to share anything else? And here we see Ibrahim alayhi salam's story. Um, this is the story about where we learn about how he destroyed the um statues. And it, was, it just kind of shows that he he really went against the notion of shirk. Physically, he destroyed the um, statues. Those who listen to the Quran and the distracted heart will fail to benefit from the Quran. Exactly. This actually reminds me of something else as well, how she talked about hastiness and being hasty in our actions. Um, and I'm pretty sure she also mentioned a story about how when the Prophet وسلم, entered a new town... Um, everyone was hasty to meet him. And then there was one person that, you know, that came peacefully. Um, he kind of cleaned himself up before coming. And Allah said that he he's blessed. Okay, he has the blessed qualities of um I think he said calmness. And he said, Allah, Allah make made that in you. Okay. It tells us about making the right decisions, yes. So when we actually listen to the Quran attentively. And again, this is, you know, through active listen, actively listening and understanding. Um, we um, This helps us in benefiting as well. Yeah, so it tells us about making the right decisions. Yeah, so this also goes back to being hasty. When we're hasty, it, we fail to make the right decisions, okay? Um, we usually make the wrong decisions because we're in such a hurry. That's just really important to be calm. Even if you're in a very pressurized moment, Dawood and Sulaiman alayhi salam, yes. Um, I hope everyone else who did not say anything was making notes because all of these stories are really beautiful and they're very important as well. Um, inshallah, we will finish the class here. Next, we will finish just 17. And then the quiz will be open for anyone who did not complete, la complete last week's quiz. It's still open till Tuesday. Okay, if there's any inquiries, you can message on the number on WhatsApp. Um, other than that, we're done. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.